Now friends, this is a course on Puritan theology. And Puritan theology is theology. And theology is reflection on God in relation to everything that is not God. And it's a discipline that God, our Creator and Redeemer, has imposed upon us all. And it should issue in worship. One of the Packer Proverbs, which is touted around this institution, is that theology is for doxology. And that remains true even when it's Puritan theology that we're going to study. Every Packer class on theology begins with praise, because praise is the first form of doxology. We give glory to God. So before going any further, I ask you to stand and we will together sing the doxology, words that I'm sure you know, to a tune that I'm sure you know, and I will attempt to present it. Together then, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now we'll pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we call upon you as our Father. In the name of Jesus, we present ourselves to you now. In the name of Jesus, we tell you that in this course, our hope is in you, that you will send your Holy Spirit to give us a right judgment in all things, that you'll use this course to lead us into wisdom, and truth, so that at the end of this course we may be wiser, better grounded, better established in Christ, better fitted for the life of ministry to which you call us all. Our eyes are to you, gracious Father. Deliver us, we pray, from any pettiness of spirit, any prejudice which would keep us from receiving truth as we should, keep us from any pride, censoriousness, looking down on men and their work when we should be looking up to them. We thank you for what you did in and through the Puritans three centuries ago, we ask that you'll give us proper respect for them. And though indeed they were not infallible and will not be presented as infallible, give us humble and grateful hearts to learn from their wisdom and from their faithfulness to you. So Lord, we commit the course to you with our hopes high, for we are praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you have before you an introduction to the, uh, sorry, you've got a syllabus um, to what is headed as Introduction to the Study of English Puritan Theology, which is one of the names that I've given to this course in the process of its evolution. And you will see that the first two of our ten sessions are titled The Puritan Identity and Puritan Theological Concerns. In order to get the show on the road as fruitfully and as fast as possible, I am going to try this morning to collapse those two presentations into one. And that will mean that on each future day we shall be running one ahead of the enumeration given here. 
and that should mean that on the last morning we have time to review and to explore any questions about the value of Puritan theology or the application of Puritan theology in the modern world which go beyond what I will have told you or suggested to you at least and which really merit um, unhurried discussion. It is Puritan theology for today that we are exploring. That means that first we must get a good grounding in Puritan theology as it was for the Puritans. One of the mistakes often made, I think, in this modern world is that people try to make contemporary applications of things before they've really mastered the things in themselves. And so the application distorts the thing and both historical understanding and present day wisdom are diminished. So I begin by rubbing your noses, friends, in Puritanism as the Puritans understood it and the first thing we have to do is to get back to that. In order to get going on this um, track as quickly as possible, I don't propose to go through the course outline sheet point by point with you. You've got it, I hope, all of you, have you? Is there anyone who hasn't got it? Oh, Brian, Brian, there's a one guy who hasn't got the course outline. Could you give him a course outline? Well, the, syllab the syllabus is the outline of what we're going to do, but the course outline is the Regent College document telling you what to expect. Now, that document... Hmm? Mm -hmm. What I propose to do, rather, is to invite you, if having scanned that document, you're bewildered by it, to ask any questions that I can answer quick, quickly about the thrust of it. I will say, before you do that, that um, there will be a research paper, as the course outline says, and there will be a, an exam which I shall give you on the last day in a sealed envelope. Um, the purpose of the exam is simply to uh, make sure that you've been memorizing and thinking seriously over the material that we cover in class. Uh, it will be, I think because this is summer school, a one-hour exam rather than a two-hour exam and you will have to answer two questions out of half a dozen or something like that, uh, questions which you'll answer in half-hour essays. Then, well, there are various other things on that document which I don't think require explanation, uh, but we pause for a few minutes just in case anybody has questions about what they read there. Uh, yeah. Here's the first question. Hmm? The term paper, yeah. Guidelines as to what you might write are going to be distributed. They're not in this uh, this first. Yes, they are. If you look in this set of five loose sheets that you've been given, you'll see again the heading introduction to the study of Puritan theology on one of them. And underneath that, suggestions for research papers. Do you see that? Everybody got that? And these are the uh, illustrations of the type of paper that will be appropriate. And if you want help in selecting or putting together one of these uh, projects with um, ideas, I mean, as to what you might read and so on, well, as Brian has already told you, there will be appointment times up on the door of my room and I'll be happy to see you at those times and help you make up your mind. Um, we give you a month after the course is over to produce your paper. Um, this is summer school and we try to be as benevolent as possible 
if you're going to have problems keeping to the, the uh, deadline, well, talk to me and uh, perhaps we'll have to talk to the bursar, but talk in good time so that we can, uh, we can arrange an extension. Um, I don't encourage you to spend uh, more than a month over this because after all you have the rest of your life to live and the longer you leave it after the course, I mean the classes have finished, well the more the effect of the classes will have worn off and the harder you'll find it revving up to write me a good paper. So common sense, which is a Christian virtue, uh, in the Bible it's called wisdom, um, says uh, get on with the paper as soon as you can. But as I say, there'll be appointment times and uh, any help that I can give, I'll be glad to give. All right? Uh, any more questions about what you've read on the Regent course outline sheet before we move into action? So you're ready to go. Well, that's an excellent thing. Oh, one thing that I'd better do. Um, I've been given this um, list of people registered for the course. I would like, like it to be passed round as now I um, move into uh, subject matter. Um, please pass and pass and pass from front to back. And if your name is here, um, ticket. And if you are registered and your name isn't here, write it in. And if you're not yet registered, well, take, take to heart what both Brian and I have already said to you about that. And the sheet will go round again tomorrow when I'll be very happy for you to put, did I, I shall ask you, uh, now that you've registered, to put your name here and indicate that you're here. Uh, that enables me to keep tabs roughly on what's happening. Uh, just one moment while I set this sheet in motion. Will you please? Yes. A long and a long and a long and a long, you see. Now, have before you, please, um, of the sheets that were sent around, the one headed England in 16th and 17th centuries, and below that, have the sheet headed, or the, well, I think, well, wait a minute, I think, the, yes, they're done on both sides have the sheet headed either Puritan Concerns or Puritan Spirituality. One is on the front, one is on the back. And then under that you have uh, a long paragraph headed the Old English Puritan. Uh, these sheets cover the ground that I'm going to try and cover now. The Puritans. Who were they? What were they? They were the most vigorous evangelicals in the English church of the late 16th and 17th centuries. The summary of English history in the 16th and 17th centuries is intended to give you some sense of how the story of the Reformation followed by what came to be called the Puritan movement, actually went. I will spend the next five minutes hitting the high spots of that story, not going through this sheet, but just telling you how it was. Luther, from about 1520 onwards, was read in England by theologians Luther was campaigning for the reformation of the gospel as the Catholic Church had been teaching it and in his judgment distorting it. The drumbeat emphases in these writings by Luther were justification by faith, which has as its background original sin, 
and sovereign grace as the source of the faith by which we were justified. You say, that sounds very much like Calvinism. Well, the Luther of the 1520s did. He wouldn't have said he was a Calvinist if only because John Calvin um, was only born, you know, in uh, 1516 and his name didn't mean anything in the 1520s. He was still a schoolboy. But Luther would have said, Augustine, working with the Bible, taught nearly everything that I teach. He wasn't quite right on formulating justification by faith and I have made the necessary adjustments. But everything else that I offer to the church is Augustine and its Bible. The King of England was Henry VIII. He was a Tudor prince, the second Tudor monarch in England. Edward VII was the, his father was the first. Oh, sorry, Henry VII, what am I saying? Henry VIII was what we would nowadays call a dictator, an absolute monarch, master of everything in his own kingdom. That was how he thought that monarchy ought to be. So religion was very much his concern, just as was foreign policy and taxation and everything else. He was a Catholic prince. He believed the faith as the Roman Church had taught it. But he was uh, also convinced that it would be a good thing for everybody if it was recognized that the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, had no jurisdiction in England. And in due course he broke with the papal jurisdiction because the Pope would not grant him a divorce from his first wife to marry Anne Boleyn and uh, he was resolved to marry Anne Boleyn so there. And as I expect you know, uh, Roman Catholics have always lampooned the independence of the Church of England led by Henry VIII from the Church of Rome uh, saying that there was nothing better than Henry's amorous ambitions behind it. Well, uh, be that as it may, um, Henry VIII chose, fingered we would say, a Protestant to become Archbishop of Canterbury. His name was Thomas Cranmer. Ordinarily, up to that point, the Pope had appointed all English bishops, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the top bishop. Henry broke with that and he got Cranmer to declare the divorce that he wanted and he declared that the Bishop of Rome has no jurisdiction in England from now on. Cranmer thought that that was right, but Cranmer was one of those who had studied Luther and was convinced that the church in England needed a doctrinal reformation to go with its independence from Rome on the administrative front. And so Cranmer, during the reign of Henry's successor, Edward VI, who reigned from 1553 to, um, sorry, 1546 to 1553, um, he set himself to achieve a doctrinal reformation in England, which he did by drafting the first version of what is now the 39 articles of the Church of England and all the churches of the Anglican Communion. That's a statement of faith. He drafted brilliantly a prayer book which is basic to the worship of Anglicans still. It's a masterly piece of work and a conservative revision of it which is almost entirely Cranmer is still in use in the Anglican Church of Canada. Uh, so if you want to explore it um, here in Canada it's not too difficult to do. He also wrote a code of canon law or disciplinary regulations for the church which unhappily could not be 
passed by Parliament during the reign of Edward VI. Edward VI was a boy king who died too soon. The story goes on that in, from 1553 to 1558, a, prin um, a princess, Mary, Queen Mary as she became, who was thoroughly committed to the cause of the Roman Church. She was on the English throne and she tried to take England back to Rome and in the process she made martyrs of 282 English Protestant and Evangelical believers from the Archbishop of Canterbury, the same Thomas Cranmer down. She burned half a dozen bishops and an a lot of ordinary clergy and ordinary laymen. And she left England solid in the conviction that whatever we do in this country in matters of religion in the future, we will not have Roman Catholicism because Roman Catholicism makes martyrs of Englishmen for their honest convictions. It was more a secular than a religious uh, attitude of mind, but it was very strong in the English, and if you go to England and chat, you'll find that quite a lot of uh, this mindset is still there to be found. Elizabeth I, daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, became Queen of England in 1558, she was resolved to achieve a settlement, a religious settlement for England that would unite the nation. She had outstanding documentary material for the purpose, that is, she had the prayer book and the articles as drafted by Thomas Cranmer. These she reenacted. The Church of England thus became the church which has the queen as its, its supreme governor uh, and the queen presented herself to the people as the top lay person in the church, not indeed interfering with the work of the clergy, but uh, making sure that the order of the Church of England was maintained. Um, and the Elizabethan formula worked pretty well. But under Elizabeth, there were folk who had uh, drunk deep of Luther and now of Calvin in theology. They had uh, fled the country in most cases during the reign of Bloody Mary to avoid the persecution. Now they were back. They'd seen continental evangelicalism at Geneva under Calvin and in other places where the Reformation had really taken hold. They wanted the Church of England to be thoroughly in line with those Reformation churches on the continent as they understood them. And so they became a kind of ginger group in the church, begging all the time for more Reformation, uh, conceiving Reformation partly in disciplinary, partly in doctrinal terms. And from 1564 onwards, these people were called Puritans by their critics. Puritan was a, a derogatory name, like uh, red for a communist and wog for an Italian and uh, the old-fashioned nigger for a black American and so on and so forth. Um, and it was... Uh, the, the name was coined and used on the principle of give a dog a bad name and hang it. The word Puritan, you see, was intended to imply that these folk were um, hypocrites, really, imagining themselves like the Pharisees of uh, Jesus' day as being purer than anybody else and then all their pleas for further reformation came from, so it, was, uh, Im, so it was implied, insinuated, came from pride, uh, pride that is, in their own way of being Christian, rather than from the Bible or from wisdom at any level or any other respectable form. However, that didn't stop the, call them the left wing, 
of English clergy becoming very largely Puritan and campaigning for reformation. The sort of reformation they wanted was further adjustments in the prayer book and grants of public money um, to be given to promising young men to go to the universities where theology was taught and prepare for the ordained ministry. Um, and also they sought reformation on the disciplinary front by seeking to organize what we may call para-presbyteries. Um, they called them classes, the Latin word classis was used in some reformed churches for a presbytery. C-L-A-S-S-I-S -S -S is the way it's spelt. Presbytery is the word that was used in Scotland and it's become almost the universal word in the Presbyterian uh, world for um, the meeting of clergy in a particular area. The Dutch, I think, are the only reformed people who, who hang on to the word classis uh, for that clergy meeting. They do, and if you have friends in, or if you, uh, if you yourself belong to the Christian Reformed Church, uh, you will know that word classis used in that way. Well, the, the Puritan clergy failed to get what they wanted from Elizabeth and her bishops they were squelched at every point. Came the 17th century, Elizabeth died and James I became king. James I had been James VI of Scotland before he became James I of England and the Puritans had high hopes of James as one who would back their pleas for reform along these lines stated. James wouldn't do it the only thing he would do in response to Puritan pleas was to authorize the making of a new translation of the Bible, which in due course was published in 1611 as the authorized version and we nowadays call it the King James Version. But otherwise, uh, James, though he was quietly a Calvinist, um, he followed Elizabeth's pattern of not inclining to the reformers at all, ensuring rather that they remained um, a group of uh, discontented left-wingers unable to implement their program. During James' reign, something which had begun under Elizabeth was very widely, very widely extended and that was well-informed, gospel-shaped pastoral ministry in congregations. The Puritans were men who gathered, well indeed they brought back to England with them from the continent and uh, extended lore, wisdom, about bringing people first of all to honest saving faith and then leading them in a path of what we would nowadays call the Christian disciplines, um, that would take them into maturity in Christ. And in the 1580s, they discovered through the work of a man named William Perkins at Cambridge, who was the sort of C.S. Lewis of the movement, um, a writer, I mean, of uh, popular small books on basic Christianity, books which sold like hot cakes and through the sales of Perkins' works, they discovered that literature ministry could be enormously significant. So all the way through James' reign and then through the reign of his son, Charles I, uh, and on until the, until, until the 1680s, the Puritans were pumping out through the press treatises, most of which had begun as uh, sermons, which then got written up for publication, but treatises on just about everything in the Christian life. And this is an aspect of the Puritan contribution of which I shall have to say a lot more as time goes on. 
The Church of England was put down, that is to say, its Episcopal and Diocesan order was simply abolished by law in the middle, um, middle 1640s, 1645 to be exact. What was going on? Well, England was in a civil war, and the, camp the, the, the defenders of the Church of England that is, the people who'd insisted during the previous 20 years that the prayer book must be used with precision and that the bishops um, were there to enforce it. Uh, this, the, this, this, this pressure had made uh, the Church of England a very uncomfortable place for a lot of the Puritans. And now that the Civil War had started and the King, Charles I, couldn't any longer control what Parliament did, well, Parliament simply abolished the Church of England. What did that leave? It left about 10,000 local churches in England without any kind of um, central or, um, what, what am I trying to say, um, uh, provincial pattern of um, government. You had, in fact, established congregationalism. Every congregation uh, going its own way, as seemed wisest and best to its members or to its, and to its minister. And the congregations called ministers, and the congregations paid ministers, and so it went on. Oliver Cromwell, who became Lord Protector of England, having risen to distinction as the best general in the army, it's a pattern which of course has been uh, reproduced over and over again in the last 40 years, to particularly one has to say in Africa and in Asia. Um, he, he, he was made Lord Protector in uh, 1653 and he too, like all the kings whom he followed, he was, because this was how monarchy ran in those days, a benevolent despot. But he was benevolent and he was public spirited and he didn't want to be exposed as the sole ruler of England with his own team of local administrators, which is how he actually was. He, wa he called three parliaments and none of them proved competent, so he dissolved them. He called them according to a principle which the Puritans had been, been um, pushing for the uh, best part of a century, of course it was, namely that other things being equal, the saints, that is, godly people, the converted, will make the best politicians and govern the country in the best way. Cromwell's parliaments were parliaments of the saints, but the saints proved very sadly incompetent in government. So as I say, Cromwell dissolved those parliaments. Cromwell was the only man strong enough and wise enough to manage England, and when he died in 1658, the country was beginning to move into chaos, and the top people recognized that the only thing to do was restore the monarchy, so they did. Uh, and Charles II, son of Charles I, became king. Back with Charles II, came the pattern of uh, parliamentary government that had been there before, whereby parliament was um, an elected body of landowners. Um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't like parliament today where everyone can stand for parliament and everyone has a vote. No, you could only stand for parliament if you were a landowner and you could only vote if you were at least a small landowner, landholder, with some property stake in the country. The parliament that came back with Charles II has been called the Cavalier Parliament. It was a parliament of very secular caste and the purpose of the parliamentarians was to have as much revenge on the Puritans who they saw as the people who'd fought the king, you see, in the Civil War and had 
abolished the Church of England and had damaged the country in all sorts of ways, they were resolved to have their revenge. So they established terms for continued ministry in the Church of England, which were intolerable to the consciences of most Puritan clergy, and nearly 2,000 such clergy sadly gave up their ministry in Anglican parish churches and went into retirement. They felt at first it was too bad to be true, and surely there would be what they called a comprehension, that is, uh, an adjusted religious settlement which would allow them to resume their ministry in the Church of England. Uh, surely that could not be delayed too long, but it never happened. And so, by the time of the very last item on this uh, sheet, 1688 Glorious Revolution, uh, it was thought of as glorious by most English people because the effect of it was to um, terminate the reign of Charles II's brother, James II, who was an overt Roman Catholic and was trying to do what Mary wanted to do, that is to take England with its church back into the Roman obedience religiously under the Pope and into the Holy Roman Empire, which was a political, uh, um, a poli a political alliance um, of Catholic countries. Uh, Protestants had summoned William, William of Orange, who became William III of England, to come over from Holland. He was distantly related to the English royal family. He was to come over from Holland and take the throne because he was a thorough Protestant. In 1688 he did, and that was that. But what about the Puritans? Well, in 1689 an act of toleration was passed, allowing them to organize their own congregations, Baptist, Congregationalist, Pres Presbyterian, Quaker, and worship freely. Um, from 1665 through to 1688, there had been spasmodic persecution of Puritans who insisted on continuing their ministry, and it is estimated that something like 20,000 Puritans, um, uh, some of them clergy, most of them lay folk, who were caught in non-prayer book worship services where, Purit where the Puritan minister was officiating, um, they saw the inside of English jails for a longer or shorter period. It was a grim time. All that the Puritans could do during that time was to publish, and they did. They weren't forbidden to publish, and so the output of what I think ought to be rated as classic evangelical material from their pens continued until t towards the end of the century. The Puritans from their beginning up to the, oh, the time of the Civil War, well, the time, the, the time of the Commonwealth, had had as their vision, quite simply, the conversion and discipling of England, which was a noble vision, and they set themselves to think and pray and evangelize and win the country uh, in a thoroughgoing and sober way. And Richard Baxter, one of them, of whom you'll hear more in this course, uh, looking back uh, in, when did he write this? About in 1665, he looked back on the way things had been before the great exodus of, of 1760 Puritan clergy in 1662. Uh, looking back, he wrote that if the uh, ministrations that had been operative during the Puritan era had continued in England, then in a quarter of a century, that's 25 years, England would have become a kingdom of saints because the incidence of conversion and serious godliness had advanced so rapidly 
uh, under uh, well, when the when the Puritans had a free hand. Well, it didn't happen, and that's the end of the Puritans' outward story. They were, from one standpoint, the great losers. I mean, they lost every battle they fought in the end. But from another standpoint, they are great winners, and the winning is still a process that goes on, because under pressure, um, in the uh, turbulence of the times, they were enabled to produce classic devotional and theological material that still inspires people. That's what I mean when I, I say that they're winners. And their legacy is the central thing to which I hope to introduce you in this course. Well, that's the outward story. And I don't propose to uh, tell you any more about it. If you want to read the Elizabethan story, uh, there's a little book by John Brown called The English Puritans, which tells it very well. Um, the story is surveyed, quite a number of the chapters in my own book, which tells the world what uh, I want the world to know about the Puritans. My book is called A Quest for Godliness, The Puritan Vision of the Christian Life, and what of the history is there, is there as part of the story of the Puritan vision of the Christian life, how it came to birth and how it was maintained in the ups and downs of changing situations. But it's that legacy, as I said, that is the really significant thing. And if you glance again at the um, sheet-headed Introduction to the Study of English Puritan Theology Syllabus, well, you'll see. If you look at the theological concerns, which are down as subdivision two, and then at the headings that follow the Bible in Puritan theology, salvation by grace, faith and assurance, the good fight of sanctification, uh, conscience, and the place of conscience in godliness, and then the Puritan lifestyle. Well, you can see from the topical headings what the Puritans were really concerned about and where it seems to me, your professor, that they made their most lasting contribution. I pause. Are things clear so far? Any questions about anything that I've said? And by the way, I'm, I'm not going to write footnotes to what I've said. Uh, these are just questions about the overall thrust of the story. Uh, did I, really, I'm asking you, did you think I muddled anything up? If so, ask me questions so I can straighten it out. I thought, of course, yeah, there. I shall only say a very little about that, partly because it's a very complicated matter to go into, and partly because, as, the, as your, your question indicates, um, historians go to and fro, the pendulum swings, on who's to blame for the Civil War. Uh, is it Charles, Charles I, or is it the Puritans? The question, by the way, which I now repeat for the sake of the microphone, was um, how far were the Puritans responsible for the civil war, the violence in England, which started in, uh, 16, <coughs> in 1640 and went on spasmodically until 1649. My view is that Charles I must bear most of the blame because in his character as uh, a dictator, the way that kings 
were expected to be and indeed insisted on being in the mid 17th century, he had taxed his subjects to a point of pain and he had inflicted on them a particular tax called ship money, tax money being raised to build a fleet, which had never been discussed in Parliament at all, even to give Parliament an opportunity to um, okay what the King was doing. Uh, Charles did believe in absolute monarchy and he had one or two ministers who uh, backed him to the hilt in this. Well, there were stout parliamentarians with names like Pym and Hamden who affirmed, trumpeted the principle, no taxation without representation and tried to do something which Parliament had never tried to do before, that is to call the king to account, make him answerable to the people for the way in which he governed the people. Uh, Charles rejected this idea absolutely and when Parliament uh, defied him, uh, he raised an army and set himself to march on London and subdue Parliament by force. He started it. Parliament raised an army to ensure that he never would be able to do that. Uh, Charles was marching south from the North Midlands where he raised his army. Uh, Parliament raised its army um, in the London area. And there were, there were a, few, a few pitch battles. The uh, parliamentary army eventually was um, licked into shape by Cromwell. Um, the, there, was, there was a purge at the of, at officer class and uh, Cromwell and his generals took over and it, the, the resulting force, the fighting force, was called the New Model Army. Right from the start of the Civil War actually, Cromwell had shown himself a brilliant commander in the field, uh, which was why he rose so rapidly um, among the, the generals, the leaders, on the parliamentary side. I don't myself think that there was any special wisdom, indeed I think that there was folly frankly, in the final move of the parliamentary leaders with Cromwell at their head, uh, they executed Charles for treason against his, his own people. And they didn't seem to see what a nightmare situation they would create by doing that. Then they had to look around and they, they hadn't really considered prior to executing the king what form of government then England was going to have. And from that standpoint, Cromwell's acceptance of the position of Lord Protector uh, during under the Commonwealth, uh, 15, 1653 to 58, as I said, was a stopgap measure. Cromwell wanted it to be a stopgap measure, but he knew that he had the ability to do the job. I hope to squeeze in a little bit about Oliver Cromwell, a fascinating figure, layman of course, very gifted, very godly, man to be admired, though as you can well imagine, after the Restoration he was hated and in schools in England right down to the present day, it, it has been more common than not to represent uh, the parliamentary cause as a form of rebellion against the rightful ruler and Cromwell as a deluded fanatic and uh, a man not to be admired but to be execrated. Uh, there's been a lot of um, that kind of bad press um, rega regarding uh, just about everything actually on the Puritan side. Puritan godliness was lampooned by the name Puritan as I told you earlier and Puritan politics were lampooned in the same way by hating Cromwell, hatred of Cromwell and um, rubbishing all that he tried to do. 
Now, I'm going to stop there because um, I've already spent more minutes than perhaps I should in, ans in answering the question. I've given you my perspective, which is all you could expect me to do. Um, you may know of how, uh, how historians in England, particularly, have been lining up this last 20 or 30 years on different sides in this issue, uh, shifting the emphasis as to who was, who was really responsible for what was going on. But uh, I said, at least I said to myself, whether or not I said to you, five minutes, I had the five minutes. And you folk are beginning to get dry and you need uh, a break and an opportunity to grab some coffee. It's uh, midday and I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. Have a 10 minute break. Come back at 10 after 12 and I will begin then to go through the, the um, outlines on Puritan concerns and Puritan spirituality so that you know rather better who the Puritans are. But off you go now. <laughs>